So we're just going to finish off our kind of quick uh, tour of, of convexity and optimization, give you guys a preview of, of why this kind of stuff is useful. And then next week, we will do concentration of measure. Is that right? Concentration of measure. Um, your homework, your fourth and last homework is post-it. And besides that, the only commitment you guys have is the, um, are the projects. So you guys are going to be doing reviews for the projects. You're going to be reviewing each other's project progress reports. Did we talk about that? I can't remember um, in this class. No? So this is something new we're trying this year. Um, we're, we're excited about it. We're hoping it's going to be fun. So you're going to be reviewing each other's progress reports as if you're uh, you know, reviewing papers for a conference. And the reviews, that, the scores you assign to each other's project proposals or progress reports, they're not going to affect your final grade directly. We're not going to you know, assess um, your progress report grade based on those. We're going to grade them ourselves. But we're going to use the reviews to look at the top 12 scored progress reports. And then among those, we're going to pick something around like six. And those six projects, we'll get a chance to do a spotlight talk at the end of the uh, semester, kind of like a spotlight talk in a conference. So we think it should be fun. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll tell you more details about the actual kind of last week of courses as it comes closer. But for now, all you need to know is that you're supposed to review each other's progress reports. It's anonymous, so you can't see who you're reviewing. Um, and when you give the scores, the, they won't be able to see who reviewed it as well. It'll be doubly blind. Um, but please take that seriously because you know, uh, you know, we want this to be kind of a good experience for you guys. We want to have some nice spotlights at the end. Don't be too critical of people's progress reports. That's not the point. We're going to grade them. Uh, you just um, score them as you see fit. Any questions about that? OK. Um, any questions at all about what's to come in the class? So last time we talked about convexity for most of the time. Um, we talked about the notion of convex sets and convex functions in detail. Um, that may have seemed kind of boring to a good number of you, but you'll see that uh, as you go to do your homework or you know, as you consider more of these types of problems in the future, that those notions are really super useful. And they're very fundamental. So having a good, a good grasp of convexity, um, especially convex functions, will serve you very well. And I won't. Um, go through a review of that. We usually review what happened in the last class at the start of each class, but I think that was fairly basic so that hopefully it's still stuck in your mind. We're just going to jump right into um, the next parts, which are the KKT conditions and duality. And that'll be what we talk about today. Um, before we get to those, I wanted to talk briefly about subgradients. Um, how many people have learn what a subgradient is in another course. Put up the screen as well. Yeah, I think that's fine. I think I may be blocking part of it, so so I didn't have it initially, but It'll come on in a few seconds once that warms up. How many people have learned subgradients in a previous course? OK, what co I'm just curious. When did you learn them? What course was that? Oh, 725. OK, so those of you who didn't take 725, have you learned subgradients? 715. OK, that might be a new thing. Um, so I'm not going to go into much detail about them, um, because I want to make sure we can talk about the next two topics. But I'll just tell you what they are and give you a few examples. And then the notes, the class notes, have uh, you know, quite a bit of detail on them. So make sure to look at that if you're having trouble or if you're curious for more information. OK, um, so remember that for convex differentiable functions, so if we have a convex function f and it's differentiable, then we know that um, 
it has the following property that if I look at the value of f at some point y and I form a Taylor expansion, first order Taylor expansion of f around another point x, then the Taylor expansion is always going to underestimate the value of the function. Right, so this was this picture. If I have up some point x and I form the, the tangent to my function given by the first order Taylor expansion, and I look at the value of the tangent line and the value of the function somewhere else, say at a point y, then the tangent line, which is this, right, the first order approximation, is always a global underestimator of the function itself. So subgradients are really just the generalization of this idea to the case when the gradient doesn't exist. So a subgradient of a function doesn't need to be convex, just any function f at a point x is some g such that we have this property with the gradient replaced by g. for all y. Okay, so if we can achieve this uh, kind of global underestimator of the function when we try to form a tangent plane at x, then that's, we call uh, the g that gives us that a subgrading of the function. Right, so we can immediately see that for a convex differentiable function, f, g will just be taken to be the gradient. That is a valid subgradient, right? Because it, it, we know it has this property. Um, it's actually true that this is the only subgradient. In this case. So for a convex differentiable function, it only has one subgradient. That subgradient is given by the gradient. There's no other vector g we could choose to make this true. Okay, that, that is a property of smooth convex functions. Um, for another function, let's say for this one, let's suppose this were the point x. Based on how I've drawn it, you know, it's not maybe perfectly easy to tell, but I think you can see the point. Can there be more than one subgradient here? What do you guys think? Yes or no? Yes, yes there, there could be, right? I could take looks like anything in between, say, any line say that has slope in between, say, these two to form an underestimate of the function. So in general, there can be more than one subgradient g at x. And how about this function? This is the smooth function. Let's suppose that point was x. What are the, what are the subgradients of that function at x? Yeah, there are none, right? So there can be more than one subgradient. There also can be none. Also could be no subgradients. So for general functions, there could be zero subgradients, there could be only one, there could be more than one. Um, subgradients are, I guess, a bit of a tricky notion if we're talking about generic functions. But for convex functions, they're very well understood. So if we look at just the class of convex functions, then subgradients always exist everywhere. And for uh, smooth functions, right, if it's convex and smooth, there's only one. And that's the gradient. OK, so this is the definition of a subgradient of a function. The notion of a subgradient, like I said, it's, gener it's general. It doesn't only apply to convex functions. 
So that for non-convex functions, we, not, we may not have any subgradients at some points. Even for smooth non-convex functions, right? This is a smooth function. It's non-convex. So we can see it doesn't have a subgradient at this point x. Um, I think it just helps to do a few examples. There's lots more we could say about them. Read the notes if you're curious. All you're going to need to know for the homework and really for the rest of the examples we give is the subgrading of the L1 norm. Right? The L1 norm is a special case where it's a convex function because it's a norm. Right? We learned last time that any norm is a convex function. And it's non-smooth. Uh, why is this non-smooth? Well, um, you can think about along any coordinate axis, this is not going to have a non-differentiability. Right? When one of these components is equal to 0, it's like the absolute value function. So let's see if we can characterize the subgradients of, uh, of the L1 norm. Let's start off actually with the absolute value function. So let's just start off with the easy case where Um, f of x is just the absolute value of x. We're in one dimension. Right? I think it's pretty intuitive to see what the answer is going to be here. So this is our function. And uh, we want to know what are the subgradients of, of f at a point x. We denote that by this. The set of subgradients at x are written like this. are denoted by uh, this set. So let's, let's think about in cases. What happens when x is bigger than 0? When x is bigger than 0, this is a differentiable function. right? It's, it's convex. Its uh, subgradient should just be its derivative. And we can also see that if I, ever, if I put a point, if I place x here and I ask for the underestimators of this this is the slopes that give me an underestimate of this function. The slope can only be 1, right? So it just is the set containing 1 if x is positive. And similarly, it's the set, set containing minus 1 if x is negative. And that was quite straightforward. Um, how about if x is 0? What are the allowable slopes that I can use? Right, it's just the interval from minus 1 to 1. I can take any slope right, between minus 1 and 1, and it'll give me an underestimator of the function. So a more concise way of writing that is, um, right, the subgradients, subgradients of f at x, if f is the absolute value function, um, is equal to the sine of x if x is not equal to 0, and otherwise it's anything in between minus 1 and 1. OK, now, now for um, the absolute value, you know, the more general case where we lift the absolute value up to Rn and we just take the sum of the components in their absolute value. Um, you should be able to convince yourself, based on the definition or even based on your intuition, that um, any subgradient. G which is in the, uh, you know, right like this. Any subgradient at the point x satisfies the following. Um, the, in the ith component, it's just equal to, or we can say it's, it's even in, the set containing the sine of xi if xi is not equal to 0, and otherwise it's anything in between minus 1 and 1. OK, it's the same logic we had for the, the one-dimensional case, except now we're applying this logic component-wise. OK? So that's really the only example you need to know for the homework and for, uh, for the examples that we give later today. Um, there's lots more examples in the notes. Um, I would say subgradients are one of the most useful things you can learn.
in, in a, I'd say just period in terms of mathematical foundational things in graduate school, they come up a lot. And you know, I would spend uh, time on them if you're having trouble with these concepts. Or just I would just look through the notes more carefully. Um, I'll just give a few properties that I'll call calculus of subgradients. So this is like um, what kind of operations can we do and then still know subgradients. Um, and this is analogous to what we did with conve convex functions. Right? We tried to figure out what are kind of a set of legal operations that would produce us convex functions after we combine them. So he, I'll just mention three. And the last one is especially useful. Um, scaling. I mean, these are, these, some of these are trivial. The set of subgradients of, uh, you know, let's just say for convex functions. So the set of subgradients of some scalar multiple of my function is just that scalar multiple of my function, um, of, of the subgradients of my function, provided that A is positive. So I'm looking at the set of subgradients at some point x of the function A times f, then it's just A times the set of subgradients, provided that A is positive. Right? This, this restriction makes sense because otherwise I would flip f from being convex to concave. Um, addition. So if I look at the subgradients of the sum of two functions, it's the subgradients of the first plus the subgradients of the second. This rule actually explains how we got the L1 norm as well more formally. Right? Because the L1 norm we can think about it, it's the sum of absolute value functions over the components. Um, you can use that to produce subgradients for the L1 norm. And then this one, I think, is, yeah? Uh, so if the subgradients of f1 constitute a set of size m, and f2 constitute a set of size n, the subgradients of f1 plus f2 would be a set of size mn, right? Yes, so th this means that every element of this set plus every element of this set. So we're using um, this notation, right? This sets a plus b is set of all a plus b such that a is in a and b is in b. Um, and the last, the last uh, property that I'll go through is affine composition. So this is the closest thing we have to the chain rule for subgradients. So you know, with, with uh, smooth functions, we have the chain rule, right? The gradient of one function composed with another is given by um, a specific combination of their gradients. We don't really have the same kind of generic chain rule for subgradients, but we have it if you want to compose a convex function with an affine function. And this ends up, you know, like many, like many of the affine rules we learned, this ends up being quite useful in practice. So the set of subgradients of, so let's suppose we have a convex function f, and I'm going to find a new function g by taking ax plus b then the set of subgradients of g at the point x is equal to a transpose times the, sub, the set of subgradients of f at the point ax plus b. Okay, this, this should also remind you of the chain rule, right? If this were a gradient, then this would be exactly the same thing as the chain rule when I compose a function with a linear function. Um, this, in particular, you'll, you'll use on the homework, this rule for, um, for subgradients. OK, uh, any questions about them? I'm going to kind of breeze through the duality, assuming that that made sense. OK, so um, here's where I think things can get fairly surprising. I think most of what we learned so far in terms of the convex, uh, convex rules for sets and functions were not surprising. They were intuitive. You wouldn't have, uh, you know, you wouldn't have been shocked if I told you that the sum of two convex functions is is still convex, or, um, you know, some of the examples may have been a little bit more complicated than you would have thought off, off the top of your head. But they, the rules weren't necessarily surprising. Um, duality, I think, is a very surprising topic. It's very, in a sense, it's very um, subtle. The arguments that are used in duality, but it's it's very powerful as well. So. We're going to go back to a generic optimization problem that has this form. 
So I'm going to minimize um, <coughs> some function f subject to a bunch of uh, equality and inequality constraints on my variable x. So the goal in duality, the, the place that, well, the thing we keep in mind is the goal, let's say, is to provide a tight lower bound on the optimal value, optimal criterion value. So we're going to write the optimal criterion value in this optimization problem as f star. And let's suppose, you know, before we solved it, or maybe we, didn't, we couldn't solve it because it was um, challenging or intractable, we, we want to uh, provide a lower bound on the optimal criterion value. Now in some ap applications, this actually might be meaningful. The criterion value itself, if, you, if I can get a lower bound on it, that actually might be meaningful. Um, usually we care about the solution, which we might write as x star, not, a, not of f star. Um, but you'll see that uh, duality has a lot to say about both of those, actually. We're just going to start with the idea of lower bounding the optimal criterion value. So what we're going to do is we're going to build the, so what we call the Lagrangian. This is nothing more than um, a function now that basically takes these constraints and lifts them up to the criterion. So the Lagrangian is defined in terms of three variables, L of x, u, and v. x is, is you know, our, our original optimization variable. And I'm going to assign what I might call Lagrange multipliers, or even in the context of duality, dual variables, to each of these constraints. So to each constraint, hi of x less than or equal to 0, I'm going to assign a, a dual variable ui. And to each of the constraints, lj of x equal to 0, I'm going to assign a, a variable vj. And I'm just going to define the Lagrangian by taking my criterion value, f of x, and then adding a linear combination of the constraints where the, the weights of that linear combination are given by these dual variables. OK. Um, now, there's a, there's a key property of the Lagrangian that we're going to see shortly makes it very useful, which is that if x is feasible, which means that it satisfies the constraints. So all that I mean is that x satisfies these constraints, and it's in the domain of these functions. Nothing to do with x being optimal. All has to be is feasible. If x is feasible and u is non-negative in every component. That's all only the restrictions I have to place on u, that every component of u is non-negative. Then we're going to see that L of x uv um, is equal to f of x plus the sum of, just by definition, right, ui hi of x plus the sum of vj Lj of x. And now, what is this? Because s, x is feasible, each of these is less than or equal to 0. And because x is feasible, each of these is equal to 0. And by assumption, ui is, is bigger than or equal to 0 for each i. So this whole thing is just less than or equal to f of x. So I'm adding something that's non-positive here, and that's 0 here. So the Lagrangian lower bounds the, the function f at every feasible point. So sometimes you might see a picture drawn like follows. I can't remember if I have one of the notes or not. Uh, no, I don't have one of the notes. But you can think about it. If I just pick some u that's bigger than or equal to 0 in every coordinate and some v, and I fix those, and I look at L of x u v, and this is going to be less than or equal to f of x for all feasible x. So if I were to draw this function, uh, my criterion function, over its constraint set, right, it might look like something. 
then the Lagrangian is going to provide a lower bound on that function everywhere. So what do we know about this? That means that um, right, f star, this, this is where we use it, which is equal to the minimum over all x in the feasible set. Let's write the feasible set as f of f of x. By definition, right, this is the feasible set. This is bigger than or equal to if I minimize x over the feasible set um, and I minimize the Lagrangian instead of my criterion function, right? Because each of this is pointwise bigger than or equal to that. So certainly the minimums are going to obey the same ordering. And furthermore, that's bigger than or equal to if I minimize over all x, not just x that are feasible, but all x, the Lagrangian at x u v. Right, so this is this is true, provided that u is bigger than or equal to zero and v is anything. Okay, so I want to make sure we follow these arguments because they're like they're very simple. I don't think there's anything complicated here. They're just a bit subtle. Any questions? So this function, we're going to define as another function, g u v, right? Because it's not a function of x anymore. We've minimized out x. It's only a function of u and v. So this is just notation. I'm just denoting this by g u v. This we actually call the Lagrange dual function. And what we've proved. is that for any um, u and v such that u is bigger than or equal to 0, g u v provides a lower bound on f star. OK, so that was our goal. And we've achieved it with this function uh, that we call the, the dual function g u v. So let me go through an example. Let's go through one example so we can get an idea of what this looks like. So as an example, let's take a quadratic program. So our problem is going to be as follows. We're going to minimize over all x 1 half x transpose qx plus b transpose x, um, subject to two constraints. One is that ax is equal to b, and the other is that x is bigger than or equal to 0. So whenever I, I think I've said this before, but just so that we're clear, whenever I write um, a vector is bigger than or equal to 0, I mean that's true component-wise. If I write an inequality, I always mean that's true component-wise between two vectors. So um, with this QP, right, we can actually go through the motions that we uh, talked about up here and see if we can derive the Lagrange dual function. First of all, note that the, the optimal criterion value here, f star, that's not at all obvious. right? If I asked you what the optimal criterion value was with no constraints, then that's something you could do. Uh, analytically, you could take the gradient here and set it equal to 0, which we know is. Um, Actually, we have not talked about that yet. That's what we'll talk about next, which are the optimality conditions. But even, say, from high school mathematics or undergrad mathematics, you know that I can minimize a function that's convex by differentiating it set an equal to 0. So you could do that. And then you could plug in the value of x, which is explicit. And you could come up with what the optimal value is, f star. Once I have those constraints, that's no longer possible. Right? This problem encapsulates a huge class of problems, like Lasso, support vector machines, um, a bunch of separating hyperplane variants. I mean, a lot of stuff th that we know we just can't generically have, have close form solutions for. So uh, finding f star or lower bound f star is, is super non-trivial. But we can do it with duality um, in a certain sense. 
let's go through the steps. So let's pick, form the Lagrangian, right, which is given by introducing two variables. Let's call u the variable that corresponds to uh, the constraint. Well, we let's rewrite this constraint as minus x is bigger than or equal to 0. And let's assign u to that constraint. And let's assign v to this constraint. So we really have a bunch of constraints here, and v is one for each component. And we have a bunch of constraints here, and u is one for each component. So the Lagrangian I can write as the criterion, right, by definition, it's f of x plus the sum of uh, ui times the constraint functions xi. But I can just represent that more succinctly by u minus u transpose x. Right? This is the sum of ui times minus xi. And um, also, I can write plus the sum of vi times the equality constraints. The equality constraints are that ax minus b is 0 in each component. So I can represent that more succinctly like this, v transpose ax minus b. Okay, That is the Lagrangian. It's just a function of um, x and then u and v. Let's just rearrange that so that we have we collect terms that depend on x. Because eventually we're going to want to minimize this over x, right? To form the dual function. So uh, x transpose qx is the only quadratic term that we see. The other terms that we see look like this. Um, we can write them as b, say, minus u plus a transpose v transpose x. And then I just have a term that looks like minus v transpose b. OK, so what do we know about this guy? We know that if x is feasible and u is bigger than or equal to 0 in each component, this is less than or equal to the criterion. Right? But here's the beauty of duality. Um, minimizing this over the feasible set is no easier than minimizing the criterion over the feasible set. Right? It's, it's really the same thing. That's why we made this second step here, which is we got rid of the minimum over the feasible set. And that still provides a lower bound. So minimizing x unconstrained now for this function is actually quite easy. And in many cases, beyond this quadratic case, we'll also see it's doable. So instead of looking at minimizing this over the feasible set, which is kind of akin to minimizing the criterion over the feasible set, we're going to minimize the Lagrangian over all x. And we're going to call that GUV. So it's the minimum of this over all x. And let's just write that as, um, write this whole thing here as c. So it's the minimum of 1 half x transpose qx plus c transpose x plus this constant. How do I do that? Well, that's what we mentioned just a, a while ago. To minimize this, I can just take its gradient and set it equal to 0, an unconstrained, unconstrained quadratic. Okay, and if you do that, you'll see that the minimizer is given by uh, taking x equal to, in this case, minus q transpo, uh, sorry, q inverse times c. So that's something that you know should remind you of uh, a one-dimensional quadratic. The minus the the Minimizer of a, of a quadratic in one dimensions, um, you know, ax squared plus bx plus c is just minus b over 2a. We're doing the same thing here. Minus this b divided by 2a, but a is a matrix, so we're taking its inverse. That's what the minimizer is. And when you plug it in, we see that guv is equal to this function evaluated at this point, minus uh, q inverse times c. What you'll see that we get is um, minus. 1 half c transpose uh, q inverse times c minus v transpose b. That's what happens when we plug that in. And let's just remember that I was just using this for short form of c. So the minimizer, uh, the, the minimum, which is the Lagrange dual function, is actually uh, minus 1 half b minus u plus 
A transpose V times Q inverse times B minus U plus A transpose V minus V transpose B. Okay, so that was, um, that is explicitly the Lagrange dual function. And if I take any U that's um, non-negative in each component, then this provides a lower bound on F star. You can see what we end up with is, that, is something pretty non-trivial, right? If, if you looked at this quadratic program and I, and I stated this is a lower bound on, the, on F star, it would not be easy to see that. But the proof that it's a lower bound was like two lines, right? We went through this construction up here. It's very straightforward, the proof that it's a lower bound. It's really just, it just follows by construction. Okay. Um, how many people think that if I minimize, sorry, so, so first let me just state that um, we have, in general, GUV is less than or equal to F star, right, for all U that's bigger than or equal to zero by construction. So this is a valid lower bound. How do I get the tightest lower bound possible? Well, it's, it's pretty natural. I just maximize this over all possible values of u that are bigger than or equal to zero and all these. So it's still true that if I take the maximum over all u that are bigger than or equal to zero and all v of g u v, that's still less than or equal to f star. This is actually called, you can guess what this is called, the Lagrange dual problem. And when we talk about duality, we almost always refer to Lagrange duality, so I'll never, I just usually don't say the, the specifier Lagrange. So this is, this is the dual problem, that's the dual function. By construction, the optimal value of the dual problem is less than or equal to the optimal value of F star. Now really, any, any feasible U any u that's bigger than or equal to zero, which is dual feasible, it's feasible for the dual problem, will provide an, a, a lower bound on f star. And the tightest one provides the tightest, the, the maximum of all these provides the tightest lower bound. Right? We might denote this mac, denote its criterion value at optimality. By g star. And so g star is less than or equal to f star always. Now here's what I was asking um, slightly earlier. How many people think that uh, in general as I maximize the, the dual problem over all values, I'll have something that equals f star? And those of you that are in convex, uh, maybe you can just not tell me the answer for a second, mm -hmm. or I've taken it. How many people think that I always get a tight lower bound? You can raise your hand, say, always get, no. So how many people think you, you rarely get a, a tight lower bound? Okay, Kevin looks like he's suspicious of both claims. So what, what do you think? Yeah, you. Okay, so yeah, that's a good point. Let's focus on convex problems. We didn't actually specify at the start, whether or not we we're talking about convex or non-convex problems. If you notice, nothing in our construction for duality depends on convexity. Right? If I write on any problem, the most hard non-convex problem you can find, this is always true. So we always get, this is called weak duality. You always get that g star is less than or equal to f star, Always true, convex or not. Now what I was trying to ask about was strong duality. When is g star equal to, to uh, f star? And let's just focus on convex problems. So for convex problems, This is essentially always true. 
I'll give you a sufficient condition for it to be true. It's true if I can satisfy these inequalities strictly for some x. So as long as there is some x that has h i of x strictly less than or equal to 0, le strictly less than 0 for all x, doesn't matter if that x is optimal or not, as long as there exists a strictly feasible point for these inequality constraints that also satisfies my, my equality constraints, then I get strong duality. So it's only for, I'd say, peculiar convex problems where the constraints are defined in such a way that there are no points that strictly satisfy the inequalities that this is not necessarily true. Um, but other than that, we always have the, the optimal uh, dual lower bound matching the optimal primal lower bound, uh, optimal prior, primal value. And so let's go back to Q, the QP example. Go back to uh, the QP. We're going to have that the minimum over all x of um, 1 half x transpose qx plus b transpose x subject to ax equals b and x being bigger than or equal to 0 is equal to um, the maximum overall u and v subject to u being bigger than or equal to 0 and that's it of the optimal dual criterion which was you know, it was a bit, I'd say unexpected, but this is what it looked like. So these two things are going to match, right? Because this is F star and this is G star, provided that. a few things hold, right? First, Q needs to be positive semi-definite. Uh, and in fact, we need it for it to be invertible, right? Because we derived the dual using its inverse. And there exists an x such that ax equals b and x is bigger than 0, strictly. Now, if this wasn't true, I don't know why, we, why we'd want to solve this problem, right? Solving a QP whose constraints are only met with, with um, some of these being exactly equal to zero would be a peculiar QP. But actually, even in that case, we do get strong duality for QPs. It's just that the, the condition I stated up here was, was a sufficient condition that's not necessary. I'm just telling you what it says for this problem. We basically get these two problems matching in the criterion value, provided that these conditions hold. OK, um, at this point, you may be asking, you know, why do I care? Because I usually want x star. I don't care about f star. So if I can tell you that I can, you know, I can match f star with another, um, with another problem's optimal value, that doesn't seem like the goal of our, of our optimization pursuit. Um, what's more is that we often get, very often, that we can often relate x star, which is the solution in this problem to the dual solution, u star, v star. And the way we do that is through what's called the KKT conditions, which we're going to learn right now. So just to give you the high level view of what's going on, we will very often be able to have an explicit relationship between x star and u star and v star. We may not know what these things, we, don't, we typically don't know what these things are in closed form, but we have a relationship between them. Right? In this case, um, I don't know what u star and v star are any more than I know what x star is. This is a quadratic program. This is a quadratic program. This is not really any easier than this problem. Right? But what, this, what I'm telling you, we'll see in the KKT conditions, is that often we can express x star as a function of u star and v star. So if it happens to turn out that this problem is easier than that one, computationally, then I can go ahead and solve that. And I can just read off the solution to the problem I cared about um, from the dual solution. And we're going to see many examples where that's true, where the dual is easier than the primal. They often have complementary structure. And the, the dual is going to be 
you know, in many cases, it can be easier than the primal. Um, let's just maybe just do a thought experiment. When would it be the case that this is easier than that? What determines the difficulty of a problem like this? Well, in many cases, it may be the structure of Q. So quadratic programs, may you can reduce them to solving a sequence of linear systems okay, in an iterative fashion. We're not learning details of algorithms in these next couple lectures, but that's something that one could do. And if Q is dense, if, this, if it's a big dense matrix, it may be very hard to solve those linear systems. But it could be that for some reason, um, the interaction, say, between A and Q inverse is such that that's a structured matrix. And this becomes easier to solve. Or it could be that, in another sense, it's hard to project onto this constraint set. And this, in the dual problem, we don't have any linear equality constraints to worry about. So there are lots of kind of um, cases where it may be the easier to solve a dual problem than the primal problem. Um, or we may be able to at least understand properties of x star by understanding properties of u star and v star. And we'll see those right now when we talk about the KKT case. Any questions about duality before we move on to the KKT conditions? Is the dual problem unique in some sense? Or That's a good question. I'm not entirely sure what I want to ask, but yeah. along those lines. No, that question made sense. Um, so the, the answer is no, um, because in, ma in many instances, I can derive equivalent dual. I can derive dual problems in different ways. Um, let me just go back to this problem. So the way we derived this dual was unique. There's no other way we could have gone about it. But I can also re-express this problem in an equivalent form. So I can, let me just introduce for no reason at all another variable z. And I'll say that um, I'll call this z equals b. And I'll put another, another constraint that says that ax has to be equal to z. If you derive the dual of this problem, where x and z were your primal variables, you'll get something else. It won't be this anymore. And in fact, it may even have better structure than this one. So it may be the case that a and q don't quite multiply like that, or something. So I can always, if I always uh, express my, pro my problem in equivalent ways and take the duals of those, the duals will not match, but they're all equivalent under a strong duality. right? Because the solution to this won't, the, the optimal criterion value in some sense, and the solution for x star doesn't change once I introduce z, if it's also true that this al always matches the dual problem, then all the dual problems I derive will also have to end up being equivalent. But that's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's a good point. It's not a solidity of duality. Um, we're going to derive the lasso dual at the end of the lecture. There's more than one way to do it. And the one dual that we're going to look at in lecture is kind of the most I'd say, as the best uh, structure, it's most tractable. But there are other ways to do it that, that uh, end up being in more uh, maybe computationally or mathematically challenging to understand. And it's because we're going to have to introduce some fake variables in the lasso problem when we do that, you'll see. Yeah, so there's a bit of an art there. You know, you, you can drive dual problems for any equivalent transformation of your primal problem. OK. Um, any other questions before we go on to the KKT conditions? Yeah. Um, there's a weaker version than Slater's condition. It's, uh, it's that all of the inequalities must be strictly satisfied when the inequalities are nonlinear. So that's like a, more, a weaker version of Slater's condition that we, is typically more useful. So if you have linear inequality constraints, then Slater's condition does, the kind of most refined version of Slater's condition doesn't actually require that they be strictly satisfied, just the, the nonlinear ones. Um, and even past that, there are other conditions. There are a set of other conditions to ensure strong duality. But I'd say that Slater's condition is, is, the most, is by far the most used and most remembered. Um, if you look at the Rockefeller textbook, the one I suggested at the start of, cl uh, the start of last class as a reference, they'll have different conditions there. But in most standard convex analysis textbooks, it's just Slater's condition. It's because also we, 
we won't typically run into problems where Slater's condition is violated. Right? So actually, if we look, if we use the weaker version of Slater's condition, the one I just mentioned, where only the uh, strict inequalities need to be, only the nonlinear inequalities need to be strictly satisfied, then actually this is a sufficient condition for strong duality for the QP. I don't need to have x being strictly bigger than 0, just feasible. So if there exists a feasible point, and Q is uh, positive definite, then these are the reduced to essentially the same problem. It's a good question. Did you have a question also? Oh, so does the name Lagrange dual suggest there are other types of tools? Yeah, there are other types of tools. Um, so you might hear Fenchel duality and also Wolf duality, but they're honestly all, the, all equivalent to Lagrange duality. They're just phrased differently. Um, so Fenchel duality has to do with what, what are called convex conjugates, and it's a different way of looking at duality, but you, you don't really get anything from it that you don't get from Lagrange duality. It's just maybe it's more uh, succinctly formulated. It's form formulated in terms of what we call conjugate functions. But yeah, you're not losing out if you just know Lagrange duality. You'll basically be able to handle all the problems. Like, like ev every other good sub subject or you know, good mathematical topic, this idea was you know, reinvented and revisited many times by different people. So it has different names. That brings us to the KKT conditions, actually, which are named after Karush, Kuhn, and Tucker. Um, that's what it stands for. And an interesting historical tidbit is that um, if you read the Rock Rockefeller textbook, which was written in, I think, the 70s, you'll see they're called the KT conditions, not the KKT conditions, because Kuhn and Tucker were attributed with um, inventing them. Uh, Tucker is a giant in optimization, and so is, is Kuhn. These people are very well known. And then it wasn't until much later, um, I think maybe the late 80s, that people discovered that a master's student, who was essentially unknown, named Karush, had these in his uh, master's thesis from the 40s. So this was like way before Kuhn and Tucker looked at them. And so they tacked his name on first to try to give him some credit for it. So now, I'd say 1990 till today, we refer to them as the KKT conditions, not just the KT conditions. So it's a pretty nice achievement for a master's student. Um, let's take a very short break, a couple minute break, and then I'll, I'll go through them. Let's get to the KKT conditions. I've, I've written them out up here so you can take a look at them. Just to remind you, we're looking at a problem of this form, right? Minimizing some function, subject to hi of x is less than or equal to 0 and lj of x is equal to 0. And the KKT conditions are a set of four conditions that I've written here that characterize optimality in this problem. So when you were, you know, say in high school or in undergrad, you learned that if I take the derivative of a function and set it equal to 0, that's smooth, then I get all of its extreme points. Um, and if it's convex and I take its derivative and set it equal to 0, then I can characterize its minimizer. That is the generalization of that idea. The, the KKD conditions generalize that idea to an arbitrary problem. Okay, and we'll see that convexity plays a special role as well. So does duality. That's why we learned duality first. So here's my problem. I'm interested in either solving numerically or, or understanding from the perspective of this, the uh, points that minimize this. And here are a set of four conditions associated with this problem. The first is called the stationarity condition. And that reads that 0 should be a subgradient of the following function. This is actually just, if you look at it, it's the Lagrangian when I uh, take the subgradient with respect to x and leave u and v fixed. So another way of reading that off is that 0 should be in the subgradient of the Lagrangian when I look at the subgradient only with respect to x. You know, so we might write it as to distinguish what variable we're considering for the subgradient, we might distinguish it in this way. That's the stationarity condition. If all these were differentiable, right, what would this be? This would just be that 0 is equal to 
the gradient of f of x plus the sum of ui times the gradient of hi plus the sum of vj times the gradient of lj. That'll look like a Lagrange multiplier calculus that you maybe have seen as well in, in previous courses. Okay, but in, the stationarity condition is more general. It just says that even if these functions aren't smooth, I have to have zero that's being in the subgradient of, of the Lagrangian with respect to x. Okay? That is actually equivalent to, it's a completely equivalent statement, saying that x minimizes, minimizes uh, L x u v over x. So maybe I'll write it L dot. So if I just fix the Lagrangian at u and v, then this statement is actually completely equivalent to this. That'll, that follows from a very simple argument given in the notes. So that's the first condition. That, oops, sorry about that. That if I uh, form the Lagrangian, I stick in u and v, then x must be the minimizer of that. The second condition is called complementary slackness. And that is that ui times hi of x has to be equal to 0 for all i. Which means that either this constraint is tight, either the inequality constraint that I'm putting up here is equal to 0 at the solution, or equal to 0 at x, or the corresponding dual variable is itself 0. Right? Only uh, at least one of those two things has to happen according to this condition. And the last condition is called feasibility, and it's broken up into two conditions, primal feasibility and dual feasibility. It's just saying that x has to satisfy the primal constraints, u has to satisfy the dual constraints, so no constraints on v. So here is the most important thing about the KKT conditions, which is that if x, let's call it x star, u star, v star, satisfy the KKT conditions, then x star is primal optimal so it's the optimal solution or it's a optimal solution of the primal problem and u star and v star are dual optimal which means that if I were, were to plug in x star here right it gives me the optimal value f star, and if I plug in u star and v star in their problem, it gives me the optimal value g star. So the KKT conditions are always sufficient for optimality. Now, the amazing thing is that this is true always, again. Not only for convex problems, always. For a non-convex problem, if you're lucky enough to satisfy the KKT conditions, once you write them down, you have a solution. It's always true. The proof is very short. It's in the notes, just that we're running out of time, and I want to make sure to give you examples. Like duality, the proof is just a few lines. All this stuff is very short. Now, let's think about the other direction. If I have a solution, must it satisfy the KKT conditions, right? We've proved that the satisfying the KKT conditions imply a solution. What about the other way around? So if x star uh, u star, v star are primal and dual optimal, right? Which means that uh, x star is the solution for the primal problem, and u star and v star are solutions for the dual problem. And strong duality holds. Which means that the, when I look at f star, and I look at g star, and I evaluate them, that are given by you know, x star and u v star respectively, then they're equal, then they must satisfy the KKT conditions. So the reverse statement's not quite as strong, right? Always sufficient, necessary under strong duality. 
That's the summary for the KQT conditions. But if we have a, so let's, you know, summarize them up. But if we have a convex problem, and Slater's condition holds, right, which is very likely if we have a convex problem that Slater's condition will hold. This means that there's just strictly feasible, uh, there's points that satisfy the inequality constraint strictly. Then the KKT conditions are true if and only if we have a solution. So they're, they completely characterize optimality. All right, any questions about that? The proof that these two are true is very short. They use duality kind of exclusively, and it's in the notes. So you guys can take a look at that if you're curious. But it's a very powerful set of tools. This, is, this and duality are what you'll carry forward to look at stat and ML problems from now on. If you're, if you're thinking about trying to understand, say, certain properties of optimization problems given um, kind of we, that we know this set of tools. So let's go through a few examples, unless there's questions. Um, all right. For the lasso problem, the KKT conditions, we actually wrote them down during the lasso lecture. You'll now recognize them, um, given that I, you have them here. The lasso problem was unconstrained, so it looked like minimized to some function without constraints, right? So what is that? What are the KKT conditions reduced to for an unconstrained problem? All they reduce to is this. All of these go away, right? Because there are no dual variables, because there are no constraints. There are no primal constraints. All of these go away, and actually all of these terms go away as well, because there are no dual, dual variables. They just reduce to the subgradient of our criterion function at the point x must contain zero, right? So let's just do a little reminder. For the lasso problem, the criterion function we wrote in terms of beta, right? it was uh, y minus x beta squared plus lambda times the L1 norm of beta. The KKT condi conditions reduced to whatever the solution is, I have to be able to take a subgradient with respect to beta, and that has to contain zero. So what are the subgradients of this function with respect to beta? Well, let's use some of our rules. So sum of two functions, I can take subgradients of this one and add subgradients of that one. So let's look at this one. This is just a, um, that is a differentiable function, right? So I can just take its gradient, ends up being minus x transpose y minus x beta. Uh, this is non-negative, so I can just multiply whatever the subgradients of the L1 norm are by lambda. We learn what those were. Let's just represent them like by s. And we're saying that for some subgradient s, I have to have this being true where s i is either equal to the sine of beta i, if beta i is not equal to 0. Otherwise, it's anything in between minus 1 and 1. Right, that's exactly what you saw in the lasso lecture. And you saw also how we, from the KKT conditions, we actually learned some stuff about the lasso. So we're not going to go through that now. But I just wanted to. Come back to it so you can see you know, where they came from. Let's do, um, let's do the graphical lasso, because of the timeliness that we just learned with the uh, graphical models. Let's look at the graphical lasso. Did you cover that uh, quickly? OK. So this is a very interesting fact about the graphical lasso that um, wasn't actually discovered until maybe a couple years ago. 
And it almost makes the graphical lasso seem embarrassing in some ways, to be honest. It makes it seem embarrassingly simple. Um, but it comes right from the KKT conditions. It's another example of something that we can learn. You know, the first example of things we can learn were maybe some of the lasso facts we saw from the KKT conditions. It's another example straight from the KKT conditions. So if I have a sample covariance matrix S and I want to do, I want to estimate its inverse covariance matrix, we'll call that the inverse covariance matrix of the sample, which I'm calling theta, then the graphical lasso is given by minimizing the following optimization criterion. Um, this is essentially the negative log likelihood under the Gaussian model. And then this encourages sparsity in the elements of theta. So theta, uh, the L1 norm of theta is just equal to the sum of theta ij over all i and j, just element-wise. Okay. What are the KKT conditions for this problem? Let's write them down. Well, there are no constraints. And if I take the derivative, uh, if I take the subgradient of this with respect to theta, and set it equal to zero, that should characterize optimality. So it's a, again, it's a special version of the KKT conditions when I don't have constraints. If I had constraints on theta, I'd have to incorporate them, but the KKT conditions give me a prescription for how to do that. So let's, let's do that. The KKT conditions say that if I take a subgrading of this with respect to theta and set it equal to zero, that should characterize the solution. Um, that's a good question. So he, it was asked whether this is a constraint. Uh, in, in the way I'm going to take the gradients, it's not. So um, I'm going to take the gradient with respect to theta here and here. And the gradients I write down are actually specific to uh, PSD matrices. So let me just write, write them down. Um, you may have learned another class, or you can trust me on this, that things get a little tricky when you have matrices as arguments, but if I, this is actually a differentiable function, and its uh, gradient is equal to minus theta inverse. It's also convex. And the derivative, the gradient of this with respect to theta is just s, and then we'll get to that term in a second. But to answer your question, these two gradients are actually specific to the fact that I'm, I'm modeling theta, the set of matrices PST matrices theta as a vector space of dimension n times n plus 1 over 2. So I'm, I'm basically taking theta, which is something, right? And I'm, I'm going to consider maybe to say the top triangular block of theta. That contains n times n plus 1 over 2 elements of theta is n by n. And I'm treating that as a vector space. And so you can think of all these matrix calculations that make it complicated. They really just are gotten by taking theta and unraveling it into one long vector. That vector is going to be n times n plus 1 over 2 in length. And then once I do that and take the gradients, and I kind of form them back into matrices, this is what I get. Now, if theta wasn't symmetric, this wouldn't be the right answer. So I'd have to actually symmetrize them in some way. But it's, it's maybe a bit tricky because this looks like a constraint, but I'm actually just letting this constraint dictate how I interpret the matrix. Yeah. Yeah, um, it turns out I don't really have to because of this term. So if theta essentially is in the, um, so this criterion, it's, it goes to infinity at the boundary of this constraint set. So it's kind of the, the this constraint is really written to the domain of this function. So remember we talked about domains of convex functions. You can think of this as really the domain of the log determinant function rather than an explicit constraint all good questions. I mean, this, is, this to this is not at all trivial. Um, you know, there's definitely subtleties that happen moving from this to this. For, for the L1 norm, I'm going to take a component-wise L1 norm. Um, it's the same logic as, you know, if I take a uh, L1 norm of a vector, it's really the same logic for a matrix. I'm just going to call that gamma and set that equal to zero. Gamma ij is equal to either the sine 
of theta ij when theta ij is not equal to 0. Otherwise, it's anything in between minus 1 and 1. So this is what the KKT conditions say. If you can find a gamma and a theta that obey these uh, equations, then you have the solution to the graph colossal problem. Okay? which I don't know how much Larry motivated, but it's a problem that people in graphical models consider a lot, either explicitly or as kind of an inner loop in a more complicated modeling procedure. But there's been a lot of attention on this problem out of the graphical modeling community. So here's something that's kind of embarrassingly simple that, came from the, that comes from the KKT conditions that didn't, wasn't discovered, I say, I'd say, until maybe 2012, if I'm not mistaken. And that is... Um, if we, if we take the covariance matrix and we soft threshold it by a level lambda. So this is um, be the component wise soft thresholded version of S. So it means that I take every element of, of the covariance matrix, which I have, right? Sample covariance matrix. I compare it to theta. Uh, to lambda, excuse me, some, some number lambda. And if it's um, bigger than lambda, I subtract lambda off of it. If it's smaller than minus lambda, I add lambda to it. Otherwise, I set it equal to 0, right? So in other words, S lambda ij is either equal to Sij minus lambda, 0, or Sij plus lambda, depending on these cases. <coughs> then it turns out that the connected components of S lambda are exactly the same as the connected components of theta. This is the graphical lasso solution. OK, so why is that a bit embarrassing? It's because we think of the graphical lasso as this really sophisticated problem, right? It, it, um, it's doing, we think it's doing more than just, say, soft threshold in the covariance matrix. It's actually, we don't know its solution uh, explicitly. It's given by some optimization problem. And we read off the connected components as telling us something about the conditional independence right, of our variables, as we learn in the graphical modeling lectures. If I have two sets of connected components, then you know, one set given is conditionally independent of the other, essentially, in the Gaussian model. Um, what this is telling us is that, well, we could have gotten the same answer by soft threshold in the covariance matrix. Forget about solving the graphical lasso problem. Take the covariance matrix, go through it element by element, and compare it to lambda. That will get you the same connected component structure as the graphical lasso would have given you. Now, what happens inside each connected component is, is, could be different. The KKT conditions say nothing about that um, being trivial. So it could be that among kind of a group of, of uh, variables that are in a connected component, you could have some interesting conditional independencies that are not just given by soft threshold in the covariance matrix. But the global structure, which is the connected components, are all given by th soft threshold in the covariance matrix. And what we can see that directly from the KKT conditions. And in the last maybe two minutes we have, let me prove it for you. Um, let's just say observe if theta, which is the solution to the graphical lasso problem, is block diagonal, right? So that means that I have a bunch of connected components in the solution. And I, after I, I'm going to rearrange the order of the nodes so that theta looks block diagonal. You can always do that. Then so is theta inverse with the same block diagonal structure. Right? And therefore, for each um, ij in different blocks, <coughs> 
we're going to have to have um, Sij being less than or equal to lambda in absolute value. Why? Because if we go back to the KKT conditions, look, I have that a block diagonal matrix plus, uh, or let's just say, rearrange it like this. I'll put theta inverse on the other side. I have this is block diagonal, so therefore, so must this, this matrix be. And that means for every off uh, diagonal or off block diagonal element, ij in different blocks, I have to be able to pick a gamma that's between minus 1 and 1, because the corresponding entry of theta was 0, to cancel out s. Right? But I can only do that if s was between minus lambda and lambda. So basically, if theta is block diagonal, then so is its inverse. And when I saw threshold the covariance matrix, I would have seen that i and j were, that entry was thresholded to 0 right from the KKT conditions. Conversely, if Sij is less than or equal to lambda, um, or let's just say if uh, S lambda was block diagonal, then the KKT conditions are satisfied in blocks, right? So if this was block diagonal, and my goal was to find a theta inverse and a gamma to make this true, then this essentially reduces to a set of you know, number of blocks equations with gamma i equals ij equals 0 um, for all ij in different blocks. And if gamma ij is equal to 0 for all ij in different blocks, then I must have th that corresponding entry of theta um, being 0 as well, right? Just from the KKT conditions. So this is the whole proof, these two lines, or these two statements. And I think when this was discovered, people felt a little bit, um, I don't know, we'll say surprised that the graphical lasso admits such a simple structure. Um, so in a sense, it was maybe a bit embarrassing for proponents of the graphical lasso, but at the same time, it was extremely useful computationally because now it says that we can soft threshold the covariance matrix. It'll reduce into a bunch of different blocks if I choose lambda big enough, you know, say, you know, 50 blocks or something for a huge problem. And then within each block, I can actually go ahead and solve the graphical lasso problem individually, right? This, now, if I tell you that theta was block diagonal, it decomposes into a bunch of small optimization problems. And solving those in parallel, say, is much more efficient than solving one big one. So just an example of how we, could, we can learn something about an estimate without you know, needing to run an algorithm at all just by looking at the KKT conditions. Um, we're out of time for today. Next time, I think we'll just go straight to concentration and measure, or I may do like five, 10 minutes on the lasso duel. I'm not quite sure yet, but we'll see um, what people's level of interest is. See you next week.